Key guard CJ Frederick. CJ, what's going on, man? Not much. Good to be here. Good to talk with you. Well, the season is here. Basketball season is here. Uh, just how are you feeling? How excited are you? I'm feeling good. Um, you know, sitting out the entire season last year, I'm so excited to just get back out there and compete again and play with my teammates. You know, I think we have a really special group. Um, but like I said, just really excited to get back out there and compete again. How difficult was just kind of the, the process of last year, you know, kind of building up to the season and then having it kind of ripped away from you right there at the last second? It was rough. Um, you know, when, whenever you transfer to a new school, you want to come in right away and prove that you belong. Um, and I wasn't able to really do that. I came in and got hurt uh, within the summer and then came back and got hurt again. So I really wasn't able to get my foot wet. Um, and it was it was rough sitting out the entire year, but you know, I've told a lot of people it was a blessing in disguise. I was able to get my body in really good shape. Um, you know, I got a year of watching Cal and what he likes. So, I mean, I haven't played a game for him yet, but I'm already very much advanced and know what he likes and know what to do. And I was able to see the style of the SEC play. Um, so there were a lot of benefits out of it. Uh, Cal said it pro day that you're down to 8% body fat. Just, you know, how are you feeling? How did you get to that point? And, you know, just, uh, I know it sucks, obviously, you weren't able to participate in the pro yeah. day, but it feels like your kind of confidence is an all-time high for you. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I got to credit the work I put in last last off, or last season. Um, you know, every day, I would just get on the treadmill, drink a couple gallons of water every day, clean my diet a lot. Um, and I was able to be around really good people here. You know, coaches lifting me up, players lifting me up, and I think that's a... That's a part of injuries that, you know, people, I guess, take lightly a little. You know, you don't really understand, like, how big support is. And my family was huge. Teammates were huge. Coaches were huge. You know, that has a lot to do with it. So I was really in a great spot here. Looking back at the Bahamas, uh, you know, your first time back out there for Kentucky fans to see mm -hmm. you, just kind of who you are, obviously limited minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, just how how'd you feel out there and, and how do you think you played? Uh, it's weird. You know, I felt like it just felt weird. Um, you know, it was my first time playing again. Um, I use the analogy, I felt like I was like a little kid riding on the training wheels, um, trying to get them off. You know, everything felt new again. So I was just out there just kind of winging it. Um, but ever since I've been back, you know, I thought I did pretty well um, for not playing for a while and with the minutes I had. You know, but ever since I've been back, I think I've made my biggest jump from the Bahamas to where I am now. Everything, the game's starting to slow down starting to get back to being who I was, reading the game better, um, moving a lot better. Um, like I said, the game's just starting to slow down for me and you know, I'm kind of taking the training wheels off. We're inching closer to your first game back at Rupp Arena uh, since your state championship run back in 2018 with Cuff Calf. Just what, what is that kind of a emotion going to be for you? How excited are you to, uh, I know you've gotten a three point contest, Big Blue Madness last year. You've gotten, you know, some little, you know, subtle things, but not that full in game experience since that 2018 run. Well, it's going to be real fun. Um, you know, that 2018 run was real special. Um, we had a great group of guys, great coaches. Um, you know, my grandpa, that was the last place he watched me play. Um, so, you know, going back out and rub in front of the fans, you know, seeing how they were like last season, um, it's going to be a special moment for me that first game, um, and I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, talking to Coach Rusets, uh, you know, you had to work your way up the totem pole at, at, at Cup Calf. You, start, you didn't start it as a, uh, your, as a freshman, um, and then kind of make that jump as a sophomore. Coach Rusets says that the story, uh, that you are the story, uh, that you tell every aspiring high school basketball player just kind of how you earn everything that mm -hmm. uh, you you got and, and that's kind of the story that he tells uh, other uh, you know other aspiring basketball athletes what, what does that kind of mean to you? Uh, yeah I mean like like you said I'm, I was the seventh man on my freshman team um, you know a lot of kids feel discouraged if they're a freshman and they don't play JV or they don't play varsity. You know, that wasn't me. I was sixth, seventh man on my freshman team. Um, it's funny, and that next year, you know, I kind of sat down with my uncle um, and told him I was thinking about football, baseball, basketball, but I was like, man, I really love basketball and I really want to be a Division One player. And, you know, my uncle played at Notre Dame and he was just kind of brutally honest and he was like, man, I don't, I don't know, maybe you want to try football out or maybe you want to keep all your options open. I don't know if, if that's going to be the one for you. I was like, I don't know. Like, I really, I really love basketball. I was like, I want to be a Division One player. Like, will you, will you just help me? You know, you've, you've played in big games. You play that level. Like, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Um, and we just lived in the gym ever since. Um, and like Coach said, I kind of, you know, earned everything I got. Um, just hard work. 
uh, he credited uh, to your competitive nature and your spirit said he's never seen a more uh, winning athlete, a, a harder competitor in, in his time coaching. Where do you think that comes from? You know, it's, I think I was born with it, honestly, ever since I was little, like I was just so competitive, board games, anything. If I lost, I would make the biggest fit. I hated losing and still today I hate losing. Like probably one of the worst things. I, don't, I, I do not like losing. Um, so I think I was just born with it. And then growing up in the family I grew up in, um, everyone was competitors. So, you know, if you were playing in the backyard, you did not want to lose because you would hear about it until the next time you played. Um, so I would say just kind of something I was born with. And then the family I grew up in just kind of have always had that, that competitive drive. Uh, uh, Rusats and uh, Uncle Joe would say, uh, has he missed this week? Uh, you know, they, to your face, I think they were a little tougher on you. Mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously wanted to kind of drive that competitive nature, but behind the scenes they were like, you know, you, they, he, they said you'd go on full week stretches where you wouldn't miss, miss a single shot. Uh, when was it that you kind of knew that, you know, man, I, I might be a special shooter? Yeah, um, you know, it's funny when you say, you know, I think they would say that after going into my senior season, um, this has a little bit to do with like the competitive side. My sophomore year, we lost to Newcath in the regional finals, and we were top five in the state. Um, you know, everyone gave us a lot, of, a lot of heat for that. And then our junior year, we were supposed to go back to Rupp, and we lost again. Um, so after my junior year, I was like, all right, like I, I can't keep losing in the regional finals like this. Like This is not going to happen anymore. Um, and then my work ethic just like took a whole other level after that season. Um, I was in the gym every morning, every afternoon, every night. Um, ASAP, it's like a little strength and conditioning place. I was there all the time. And I was just envisioning, you know, every time I worked out, you know, getting a rub and holding a, holding a trophy. Um, but that's really when I took that, that biggest leap. And I was like, okay, like, I think I can be really, really good. When I had that off season going into my senior year, um, I just put in so much work. And then we would play open gyms at night, and I just saw it day by day. Everything was translating, and um, you know I kind of knew I was going to have a big year, and ended up having a pretty pretty solid season. Um, but I would say that jump from junior year into the off season to senior year is when I knew I could be really good. So the, the transition from freshman to sophomore, then sophomore to junior, junior to senior. Uh, going back to that sophomore uh, season where you kind of your coaches kind of thought you know, maybe this this is what he can be, is where your potential mm -hmm. kind of started to show through. There were a couple moments, particularly you brought up that new calf game, uh, told that uh, grandpa called you soft after that loss. What, what uh, you know, obviously his history yeah, with, yeah. with new calf and, you know, just kind of what his role is in that community. Yeah. Um, when he says something, it means something. So what did, uh, what did it mean to you when he called you soft after that one? Yeah, you know, my family is really, really tough love. Um, if you didn't play well, they're not going to sugarcoat it. You didn't play well. They're not going to sit here, oh, well, you had good passes. They're not going to do that. Um, and I remember we lost to Newcath in that regional finals. And there was pizza at my family's house. And everyone was going back. And I was just like, man, like, I really do not want to go. Because like, I just knew what was going to happen. And I walked in. And you know, my grandpa was ripping me apart, calling me soft. Like, you're not ready for this moment. Like, all this, all that. And the funniest story was my cousin Jack, he didn't even play in the game. Like he had a boot on, he hurt his ankle. And we lose. And me and Jack and I walk in and my Uncle Joe just starts ripping Jack apart. And he's like, I knew we were gonna lose when I saw you downstairs playing pool at grandma's house. Like Jack didn't even play. Like he was just playing pool downstairs. Like he had no effect on the game. And that's just kind of that, that tough love, you know, I knew what, what it was going to be like when we walked in. And right when we walked in, you know, my uncle was on Jack. He didn't even play. We, Jack's the reason we lost. Like, okay. And then my grandpa's calling me soft and all this. So, yeah, that's just kind of what, I mean, you just learn. It, it, I, was, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Coach Russo said that, that he also would, you know, pick a player that you know, whoever was the best player on the, on the other team that you would obviously guard because that's kind of what you did, uh, that he would go out of his way to say, I don't think you can guard that guy. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's in your best interest to do that, to kind of light that fire under you. You get that, you get your grandpa calling you soft, you get Uncle Joe saying you're not going to be a D1 athlete. <laughs> it feels like I see a recurring theme here where people just kind of like proving, pro wanting you to prove them yeah. wrong and kind of knowing that and using that as motivation. It's funny, like even today, like 
I have such a, like it goes back to this competitive side. Even my friends just try to get under my skin because they know one little fuse, I'm going back at them. Um, so I think like you said, they kind of knew little stuff like that would just eat at me and I would do whatever I could to prove them wrong. Um, but I do want to hit on the Coach Rusat's point. I think he's probably one of my favorite coaches I've ever played for. You know, at the high school level, the high school level, um, you know, like best players are really good players on a team. Um, coaches sometimes at that high level, you know, won't say something to the best player. They'll just, oh, you're doing great. Like, just keep doing what you're doing. If you're like a top 150 guy, you know, you're not gonna maybe not get on him as much. And that's the one thing I appreciated about Coach the most. He was the, probably the hardest on his best players, um, and I think that is a reason where I am today. Um, no shortcuts. If you did something wrong, you're coming out. He got on me, um, and I really appreciated that. Joe said that there are a lot of similarities between Coach Rusets and Coach Cal. Like, they're just they're kind of their personalities, mm -hmm. their tough love, and, and yep. all that. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, Coach, Coach Cal and Coach Ruth are kind of the same way. I mean, if you're not doing something right, they're going to tell you, and you're going to want it corrected. Um, that's the one thing I appreciate about both of them. I mean, they just they hold you to such a high standard, and they're not going to lower their standard for anything. Going back to the sophomore year, there was another game. Uh, Taylor County in, in Kentucky, three-hour bus ride after getting destroyed in mm -hmm. Sarasota. Uh, what happened there? Uh, and, you know, apparently that was your coming out party. You go for 30 at a game against a couple of high, high major mm -hmm. uh, athletes, Quint Gooden, who played at Xavier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you held him to nine points. Just uh, apparently that was kind of the moment that everybody around you kind of said, maybe this kid can be special. Yeah, that's a funny story. Um, like you said, we had just got back from Florida um, and we got destroyed. Like, we played a real good team. And we came back, everyone was kind of tired. Um, and we had a film session and Coach Ruth and my uncle um, were like, hey, like, we got a big opportunity. We play a top five team in the state here. Um, you know, let's, let's come ready to play. And we got on the bus to drive to Mulberg. It was like three hours. I think it was on New Year's Eve. And I just remember like, I was like, man, like, I'm tired. I think I took like, coach was big on not taking naps before the game on the bus. I took like, out of the three hours, I think I slept two and a half hours. <laughs> like I was asleep the whole ride. So, you know, I called my dad when we got there. I was like, yeah, like I slept the whole time. I'm real tired. And my dad was like, well, like wake up. Like you got a game. So it's funny, it, I had a great game. Um, and like you said, I think that's when kind of everybody was like, okay, you know, I could, I could be something special here. Um, just played a good game and just kind of build on that. Yeah, you, earlier you talked about that, that state championship game and how was the last time that your grandfather got to see you play uh, at Rupp Arena and, and you know, the impact that he made on your life. I know that he's a very special mm -hmm. you know, individual to you. Where kind of did that come from and, and you know, how, just how special was he to you? Yeah, um, you know, my family, like I said, is super tough love, but we're super close. We all grew up in a 25 minute radius. Um, my cousin Mick and Jack, they're like my best friends right down the street. My uncle Mike right down the street. Grandma, grandpa right across the river. Uncle Joe right across the river. Second cousins right across the river. So every Sunday we were coming together. Um, you know, we would play basketball and we'd, we'd get on each other. But at the end of the day, when it was time to hold hands and pray, you know, we were a close family. We really were. Um, and I would say in high school is when, I, we were always close to my grandfather, but high school is when we really, really, you know, it was like, like this was my grandfather, but also like a best friend. Like we would go to school, my grandpa would pick us up from school, take us back, we would do homework, he would mess around with us, he would make us dinner with my grandma. So we were there all the time hanging out. Um, and it just became like a routine and we got super close. We'd go in his backyard and fish. Um, and he would always just try to get under our skin and stuff like that. But, you know, that's when we really, really got close. You know, funny story, when we, he would sit out, we had that cup calf, he would always text us the morning and be like, okay, I'm picking you guys up from school. I'm gonna be right under the flagpole. And he would always, we, we got out of school at like 2.40. He would get there at like 1.40, like an, a whole hour before we got out of school. And he knew, and he would call me. And I was in like sixth period every time he'd do this. I'm like, grandpa, like, I'm still in school. Like, what, what could you possibly want right now? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm outside ready to pick you up. My like, grandpa, we still have an hour left. He's like, oh, I didn't know that. And he would, he would just be so excited to, you know, hang out with us. And he would always have Chick-fil-A for us. You know, those are just memories that, you know, I'll never forget growing up. Like I said, he's you know, my grandfather, but also like 
my be one of my best friends. Coach Ruth said that uh, you know you would spend the night with him some nights, so you could be the first one in the gym the next morning, and, and that, so you could also be the last person in the gym leaving. Just kind of what impact did he make on your basketball career? Just kind of just instilling that you know competitive drive and, and uh, you know always always being the first one there, the mm -hmm. last one there out. He was huge. Um, you know, my grandpa wasn't a basketball player. He was a really good football player. He played at Notre Dame, and he was um, a he was an athletic director in the Cincinnati area and a really good one. A lot of people, you know, uh, knew about him. And I think I get a lot of what I do from him. He was never, oh, you need to go score 20. You need to get 30. He'd play hard, dive on loose balls, play the game the right way. And if you do that, everything will be fine. And that's just kind of the way I play. Um, I don't like to force anything. You know, I'm just going to try to always play the game the right way. Um, but he definitely was a huge, huge part of who I am as a basketball player, and he would always push me. And um, you know, after a game, if I missed, if I had 30 points but missed five free throws, he'd call me like, "Make your free throws!" Like, "What are you doing?" You know, there was always something that he would, he would look out that I didn't do good, and I appreciated that because my senior year, everyone would tell me how great I was, and he was the only one. Him and my uncle, you know, they would tell me every game things that I didn't do well, and you know, that's that's how it's supposed to be, and that was something I appreciated the most uh, from him. But like you said. If we had an early morning practice, I'd always go over there and sleep over just so I, I knew I'd get in there, be the first one. I always liked, um, it would be 6 a.m., so it'd be real dark. I always would get there at like 5.30. I always wanted everyone to come in and see my car lights on first to you know, just let them know that I was always there first. Um, but yeah, I think I definitely get a lot of, a lot of traits from him. Uh, that you have a tattoo, 3819. Uh, just what went into you know, that decision to get that? Mm -hmm. It has a heartbeat with it as well. I think on your Instagram mm -hmm. post, you said, you know, I'll, I'll, you'll always live through right. it. Uh, just what went into that decision? I was never really big on tattoos. You know, I would always say, that, ah, yeah, I'm not going to get any. Um, and then my grandfather had passed. And I think one day I just kind of like, thought of the idea. Um, and it was a really good idea to me. Uh, my grandma was able to, uh, I just got like a couple heartbeats from the hospital and put it on there. And it was just a good reminder to me, you know, that even though he's gone, you know, he'll always be living through me and I'll be able to look down or something like while the national anthem's going on after every game, I always look down and kind of give it a little tap. You know, it just reminds me that, you know, he's there and I still, I still have him with me wherever I go. Just the death itself, it was a, obviously a difficult time for, for your all's family, and I don't know how you know, in detail you want to get about it, but uh, just what were those moments like and like, how you learned and, and uh, just, I guess, the immediate you know, aftermath of it, just kind of what, what the impact that it made on you? Yeah, it was tough. Um, so he, had, he went to the, he went to the, I think it was the post office. Yeah, it was the post. He went to the post office and he was, you know, putting some letters in and he thought, that, I mean, and the moment it's not funny, but looking back, you just kind of laugh like this is 100% my grandpa to do some a crazy mistake like this. You know, he thought the car was in park, but it was in reverse. So when he got out, it kind of it drug him all the way down the hill, and he broke, you know, like a lot of things in his back, his ribs, his his legs were messed up. So we kind of knew after that, living wasn't going to be the same for him. But I didn't. Nobody expected that he would he would pass anytime soon. Um, but it was tough for me because that was my freshman year at Iowa, so it wasn't like I could just get in a car and come home and see him. Um, I remember they called me and told me what happened, and I was like, well, is it going to be okay? And they were like, yeah, he's going to be fine, so you don't, you don't need to worry about coming home. It was in the middle of the season. I had redshirted, so I had a bunch of obligations, workouts, lifts, a bunch of stuff that I had to do. And, you know, over time, it, you know, my mom and dad would have the night shift with my grandpa, so whenever they had the night shift, I would always call them and, you know, talk to them. Um, and then my uncles, they would have night shifts and they would always call me and talk to him. I wouldn't be able to talk to him, but I could hear like his little, his air coming through his nose. And that's when I kind of like knew that he was talking to me. Um, but I found out, like it was pretty unfortunate how I found out. I was playing Fortnite with my cousin and my uncle came in and was like, hey, Mick, like you might want to get off. Grandpa passed. Um, so it was a tough time just because I couldn't be there. Um, and I still didn't get to say like goodbye to him or anything. But tattoo was big for me just because I know that I got him with me. Um, you know, doctors said around that time that uh, they'd never seen a fight like that right. down the stretch. Kind of, kind of goes with your story. Yeah. Kind of how you fight for everything, your competitive nature. Um, I feel like you know you, that's something you may have gotten from him. Oh, it 100% is. Um, you know, a little a story about his fight. 
Uh, it was like in the sixth grade, I was playing, I had a peewee football game, I was quarterback. And, you know, I remember I saw my parents leave. My grandpa had fallen off the roof. And, you know, if you fall off the roof at the age of 80, like, you're probably not making that. And the doctors were like, man, like, your grandfather's like built of something different. Like he just, he just built different. And he came back from that and was perfectly fine. We had a rule though, like no more going back on the roof. Um, but man, he was so strong. And even his, you know, friends would always say how strong he was in college. Um, and I definitely get that from him. Um, just his, his mental toughness um, and what he did through that time at the hospital, like the doctor said, they didn't expect him to make it as long as he did. Um, you know, that's just kind of everything that our family, you know, stands for. He's the backbone of our family, and he's the strongest part of our family. Just from a community perspective, you know, I know he's a staple football stadium, which was, yep. you know, named after him, uh, La Rosa's Hall of Fame. Just what can you say about the impact that he's made, obviously, on your family, obviously, but uh, just the you know, greater Cincinnati area. It feels, you know, his nickname is the mayor. Yeah. So, I mean, clearly, he, he did something right. When I was young, I never really understood, like, the impact that he had on the community and I never really understood I guess how the impact that whole family had on um, the Cincinnati area and sports in general you know when you're young you don't really have a, a glimpse or a grasp of what things are going on and as I got older um, you know when you would go to Winton Woods events and they would have the we would, I just remember one event that they had like a tent for us because they were doing the Charlie Frederick Stadium uh, ribbon ceremony and you know, all the people that would come up and say hi to him and everyone would always say, man, your grandpa was the best. Um, so then you, you, you kind of start realizing, okay, like he, he had a serious impact um, on what was going on. And then once you get older, you know, I knew, you know, as a sports family, like they were really, really a predominant sports family. You know, my uncle was really good. Um, my dad was really good. My aunt was really good. My uncle Mike was also really good. Um, so as I got older, you know, I kind of started to see like, man, they had a huge impact um, on the area and it all came from my grandfather for sure. Everyone always, there, was, there wouldn't be a place we'd go to someone didn't know him or someone wouldn't come up and say hi or he wouldn't go up and say hi. Um, he was just like, he was the mayor. He knew everybody, he talked to everybody and everybody loved him. You know, I just remember at his funeral, it was packed. Um, and everyone, there was a constant theme on, man, he was just such a great guy, you know, humble hardworking, doing things the right way. That, that's just who he is. What was the most valuable lesson that uh, you learned from your grandfather? <sighs> that's tough, there's so many. Um, I think it's gotta be just how much he emphasized on hard work and never letting anything come in the way of what, what I wanted. Because I remember every year from sophomore year to junior year, junior year to senior year, I would just, I wanted to be so good. And, you know, that sophomore to junior year, I worked hard, um, and, but it wasn't good enough. And he was, he was the one that, he would be the one to tell me brutally honest, like, yeah, man, you're not doing enough. And I think that's kind of the biggest lesson I, I took from him is, man, I'm just going to work as hard as I can, and I'm not going to let anybody tell me that I can't do something. And then that junior to senior year, that's the mindset I had the whole off season, and I made a huge jump. You talked about you know just the family that you have of, of high-level athletes. You know, your aunt going to Xavier, uh, you know, uncle going to Notre Dame. Obviously, grandpa mm -hmm. playing at, at, at Notre Dame football, um, dad playing at Rylands. You know, was there pressure on you to kind of live up to that you know that standard of, of excellence in your family? You know, of course. As much as you don't want to say that there was pressure on it, there always is. Um, every family party someone saying they were the best. You know, Uncle Joe was letting everyone know he was the best shooter. My dad, oh no, I was the best. And oh, I was the best. Um, so at a young age, you see traits from your family and you want to be just like that. You want to be just as good as they are. Um, and so when I got into high school that freshman year, I wasn't that good. And that would just nag at me. And my uncle would always tell me how, oh man, I never played on the freshman team as a freshman. You know, so that stuff just nagged at me because I was like, man, like I want to be, I want to hold the legacy. I want to keep it going so bad. Um, and I, like you said, it would kind of discourage me because I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to be able to, to do it. Um, my dad wasn't as bad. You know, my dad would be like, hey, if you want to play the violin, go play the violin. I'm going to love you regardless. But my uncle was a little different. Um, and I just worked extremely hard and 
try to keep the family family legacy going a little bit. And a lot of my other family members, like my cousin Brock, played football at Ohio State. Um, a lot of other family members were really, really good too. You talk about your dad and your uncle in particular, two you know, high-level basketball mm -hmm. athletes. What were the kind of biggest lessons that you learned from those two in particular, trying to get to where you are? Right mm -hmm. now? My dad kind of started me out at a young age with basketball. Uh, he coached me at everything and taught me all the fundamentals. And then I remember we ha we played outside in the backyard, and he had I forget what happened, but. He did something that made me real mad and I threw the ball at his head and I ran inside and was crying to my mom and my dad came in and my mom was like, like Chuck, like, what are you doing? Like he's 12 years old, he's 11 years old, like what could you possibly be doing? He's like, I'm not like, he's like, my mom's like, Laura, he's like, Laura, like I'm not, like he's going to earn everything he gets, he's not going to be, even in the backyard, he's, he wouldn't let me win. Um, but after that, he was like, okay, you know what, I'm going to step aside. I'm just going to love my son, and your uncle can take it from here. <laughs> I think throwing the ball at his head was kind of like the, the end-all, be-all, and I think my mom had a little bit to do with that. Uh, but it was perfect. Um, you know, having my dad kind of step away and just have a relationship with my dad and not a basketball relationship, um, looking back, like, I really appreciated that. Um, he's my, my dad's my best friend. Um, and I don't know, we would still be really close, but if he was involved, I think that relationship would be a little different. You know, as competitive as I am, as competitive he is, as the older you get, you know, things can change a little bit when you're family and stuff like that. So he, he got out at the right time and just, like I said earlier, you know, you want to play baseball, play baseball, I'm going to love you. You want to play the violin, play the violin, I'm going to love you regardless. And looking back, I really, really appreciated that. And then handing it over to my uncle was perfect. Um, you know, he wasn't my father, so he could, he could get on me and do things a little differently. Because, I mean, there's, there's a difference when your dad does it to your, to your uncle. Um, but I still appreciated and valued my uncle's opinion so much. Uh, I, you know, if I, didn't, if I didn't get 21 game, I was like, oh, shoot. Like, I, my uncle's going to, he's going to, I knew he'd blow my phone up. Like, he just held me to such a high, high standard. And that's you know, something that I appreciate too a lot. Um, but he really took my game to a whole, whole different level. Um, we worked out so much. I just remember me and my cousins, Mick and Jack, we would work out in the morning with him, go to Frisch's up the street, you know, go to his house, watch football games, come back, play two on two, come back, work out again. And it was just consistent every, every day. Um, and he, he wanted us to be good so bad, like so bad. Um, and that's something that I appreciate a lot. But that relationship I had with my dad and him and the way it all kind of worked together, you know, my dad passing it to him and him getting to where I, I needed to be, it was perfect. It was perfect. Uh, Joe told me about you, you cracking your ribs early on your redshirt year at Iowa. Um, said that Coach McCaffrey called him and you know told him that news and was like, How, what was he doing taking a charge uh, during his redshirt year and, and you know how did he break a rib during that and said who who uh, <laughs> who you took a charge on and was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, he said that he will lay his life on the line for that program. Talking about you being here in Kentucky, what does that mean? Yeah, I mean anywhere, I'll do whatever I can to win. Um, you know, it's funny about that story. It's so like you said, I'm a redshirt freshman. Like I, I really don't need to be in the drills if, if I don't have to be. A lot of your responsibilities are weight room, extra workouts, extra shots, learning the plays. Like you're, you're, you're on scout team, but in drills, you know, you want the guys that are getting reps to get in. And I just remember Coach McCaffrey was, it was a defensive drill, and he was so mad. And he was like, you know what? Just give me four dudes I want to play. So in my head, I was like, okay, I know I'm not playing, but like this is a great opportunity for me. You know, to earn some respect for my teammates. You know and just kind of show like, you know what, I belong here. And I saw Tyler Cook coming down full speed and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> I just kind of sat there, closed my eyes and his knee went right into the side of my ribs and I just heard like a bunch of cracks and I was gasping for air and, you know, I broke my rib. But, you know, like my uncle said, you know, being, especially being closer to home and being here, man, I will do anything. Um, to win here and, you know, to get number nine again and to win an SEC championship. That's literally all I want. Um, I just want, I want to be on top again here. You know, take me through that decision to transfer to Kentucky. Obviously, there were the behind the scenes rumors of, you know, maybe this, you wanted to be closer to home and, and all that. But what really led you to Kentucky 
Uh, I know when you first got here, you talked about the possibility of you know being in front of, of your family again mm -hmm. and letting your grandma be able to see you yeah. uh, see you play back at Rupp Arena, kind of like what your grandpa got to see mm -hmm. you in 2018. Just you know, walk me through that decision. What led you here? You know, honestly, the being close to home narrative is not that had nothing to do with it in my mind when it had happened. Everything was what's going to help me get where I need to be. What's going to help me be a better basketball player? What because you. As a competitor at, at a high level, it's always, what can I do to get better? Um, and I knew that coming here would allow me to take a jump and to challenge myself and to get, to get better. And that's what you want. You want to challenge yourself and bet on yourself and um, get in a good situation. And I knew coming here, I would get better um, with the skill development they do and the great players here. Um, I knew this would be a, a good challenge for me and would uh, help me get where to, you know, where I ultimately wanted to be. Um, but, you know, a lot of other big time schools recruited me and some of them were, you know, farther out on the spectrum. And when it came down to it, I was like, OK, you know, they're all offering a little bit of the same thing. but. 45 minutes away here you know my grandma can come watch me again I can go home on Sundays and have dinner with my family I can see my mom I can see my dad I can see my sister I was like this is just this is a grand slam like this is everything I could want you know I'm going to go to a place where I'm going to be challenged I'm going to go to a place where expectations are super high and perfection is you know a must I'm going to go to a chance I'm going to go to a place where I can win you know and I'm going to be able to be close to home so it was perfect Year one is in the books. Obviously, you know, the on-court stuff didn't go as planned, but you, like you said, you learned so much mm -hmm. and you kind of understood the lay of the land. Uh, you know, playing for John Calipari. Uh, I guess, what are your goals this year and beyond now that you're here? Yeah, you know, my goal is always to win. Uh, you know, I want to win every game I play. So, you know, every year you want to evaluate yourself and look at goals. So, you know, my goals for this year are to win a SEC regular season, win the SEC tournament, you know, go to a Sweet 16, go to Elite Eight, go to a Final Four, win a national championship. Those are my goals. You know, I want to win at the highest level. And then as a basketball player, you know, obviously the end all be all, I want to play in the NBA, um, play professional basketball. You know, that's kind of what I, I kind of what I want to do. Um, but I've seen tremendous jumps in my game so far in these last couple months being here. Um, you know, I think I just kind of want to show everything I can do this season, just being a smart basketball player, you know, playing good defense, making the right plays, knocking down shots, getting in the lane, finding everybody, just trying to make the game easier for everybody um, and ultimately win games. I want to win. Uh, this was fascinating during the pro day that Cal, before anything started, you know, obviously to talk about, you know, you rolling your ankle and said that you wouldn't participate, but he went out of his way to, you know, kind of hype you up to the to the scouts there in attendance, I think 50, 60 scouts there, you know, pointed out what you did well, you know, down to 8% body fat, you know, just kind of the progress that you've made, the, the year, uh, year plus, you know, since coming back from injury. What did it mean to you that, you know, kind of he has your back even though, that you couldn't be on the floor uh, where he's kind of pushing for you to get to you know, help you reach your NBA dream as well? No, oh, he's the best. Um, he's a huge reason I came here as well. You know, when you get on the phone with Coach Cal and, you know, he, he tells you, I mean, you want to bet on yourself and you want to challenge yourself, you come here. I mean, how, how do you say no to that? I mean, he's a huge reason why I'm here. You know, ever since I've been here, I've learned so much from him. Um, and also, he's just such a great human being and all the things he does for the community. Um, he's taken my game to tremendous levels, but I think the one thing I love about him is he tells his story. He's like, if you mess with mine, I'll burn your village. You know what I mean? He just, he, he has our back through thick and thin, um, and that's what you want, uh, that relationship with your coach. Um, he'll do anything for us. Obviously, you got to ask about Blair and your all's relationship, and it just kind of, uh, what's it like having somebody so trusted and you know right down the hall from you here at the Joe Craft Center and you know how has that kind of changed the trajectory of you here at Kentucky? Yeah, I mean that that whole situation was perfect. Um, I mean, obviously us both getting hurt was terrible, but <laughs> we went through something you know we had never went through at the, at the same time, and we had started, we had started dating before that, so we I mean it wasn't like we got hurt and then met each other like we had met each other and started dating, and then unfortunately both had season ending injuries right around the same time. So to be able to go through that with her and everything was, it was great just cause, you know, like you said, she's right down the hall, I'm right down the hall every day you'd walk in, you know, she'd be in the weight room or I'd be in the weight room or she's doing rehab, I'm doing rehab. And, you know, we just want the best for each other. You know, that would just motivate us. You know, I'm working, she's working. Um, and it was something that, you know, definitely helped me in my coming back process. Uh, last thing I got for you, just closing thoughts. Message to Big Blue Nation, you know, we 
finally get to see you. It's been a long time coming. I think fans are very excited to see what you bring to the table. What, mm -hmm. what, what is your message to them about you know what you plan to bring to the table and just kind of how excited you are to be where you are? Man, my message, I just want to win every game. Every time I step on the court, I want to win. Um, I want to make you know Kentucky fans proud, um, proud product of what they're watching. I want to win a national championship. I want to win the SEC outright, win an SEC tournament. You know, I want to do all that. Um, and you're just going to see a player that's going to do, do whatever he can to do that. Play as hard as he can, make right plays, play good defense, do all the little things, knock down shots, make plays. You know, whatever I got to do to win, that's what I'm going to do. And you know, that's my message.